Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I want to start out by saying what a treat it is for me to be here with this audience today uh, to talk about a topic that is relevant to those of us in infectious diseases, those of us in the world of hematology oncology, and those of us practicing medicine or working in the healthcare setting, or those of us as patients. I uh, want, particularly want to thank Amy and the rest of the organizing committee for the invitation to speak today. Um, my talk today is on a concept of the microbiome, and in particular, how the microbiome relates to the care of the oncology patient. The microbiome is uh, a concept also related to something called the microbiota, and the microbiota is the collection of organisms in our gut and in a, in a given environment. Um, this can exist throughout different locations of the body. Each of them have their own collection of microbiota, but it doesn't have to be in humans. This can be in the soil as well, organisms that live in the soil that are naturally residing there. These are examples here of areas of the body that have microbiota as part of their normal inhabitants. Our skin, our mouth, our nose, the gut, sometimes the genitourinary system as well. The uh, microbiome is the collection of genes that those microbes or that those organisms uh, encode. And the uh, gut microbiome, therefore, are the collection of genes that reside in our gut that come from microorganisms. Amazingly, our genes relative to the microbiome genes are a small fraction. Estimates are as high as 100 uh, microorganism genes per every human gene that exists in our gut. So truly, when we say uh, we are made up of uh, the organisms that inhabit us, this is evidence to that effect. Uh, this slide I put in here, because uh, I thought it was kind of cute, but also because it depicts for us the range of microorganism that exist within our microbiota and our microbiome. The uh, fella up at the uh, top right with the long tongue and the pink, pink guy with the smile, that represents some of the good organisms that are there with us, uh, whereas the uh, yellowy green guy uh, down at the lower right, um, kind of looking very eager, is one that maybe sometimes chews some things up, and then the one with the big teeth might represent an organism that really is highly pathogenic and causes a lot of disease, disease states. Uh, and then there are just the oddball characters, too. So there's really a whole assortment of organisms, both that work for us and against us as part of our microbiome. This concept has gathered a lot of attention in the popular press, uh, with journals like this, Scientific American, and in the academic press from this extremely prestigious journal, Science, dedicating an entire issue of the, of the magazine to the gut microbiota. Microbiome alterations are where we, as healthcare providers, come in. These alterations in the microbiome can be helpful to our patients, they can be harmful, or the effects can be mixed. And so we're going to spend some time looking at some of these issues and diseases related to this. This is a very partial list of disease states that are related to changes or alterations in our gut microbiome. Uh, things that we've known about for a long time, like Crohn's disease or irritable bowel, uh, but also things that maybe we didn't used to think were connected uh, to the gut, like rheumatoid arthritis, obesity, maybe even vascular disease and certain neurological disorders. This is a immunofluorescent stain from the brain of a uh, patient who had Alzheimer's disease, and those green dots are amyloid plaques, beta amyloid plaques, which have long been associated with Alzheimer's disease and for many years were felt to be the real problem in Alzheimer's disease. What we're wondering now and learning now is that really maybe it's not those amyloid plaques that are the cause of the trouble, but in fact, maybe those amyloid plaques are a result of the body's immune response to an infection. And salmonella infections, uh, which we all know inhabit, it can involve our gut, are, have been linked to subsequent beta amyloid development in plaques in the brain and Alzheimer's. So this is one example of how the gut and organisms in the gut 
can potentially affect areas of the body remote from, uh, from the gut. The real connection here between these organisms in the gut and disease states elsewhere in the body is inflammation. It's all about inflammation. This graphic here uh, from Nature Reviews magazine helps explain how this happens. If you look up at the top of the slide, you'll see what is the lumen of the bowel, which is full of microorganisms, full of our microbiota, full of our microbiome, our gut microbiome. And then down at the bottom of the slide, uh, that represents the bloodstream uh, and other uh, areas outside the bowel wall. Uh, the yellow in the middle represent the cells that are the wall of the colon. And you can see I put a, a highlight, a circle there, around the area where these microorganisms are crossing over from the inside of the bowel to areas outside the bowel like the bloodstream. And they crawl between the cells or sometimes get directly through the cells. When that happens, that's called bacterial translocation, and that creates inflammation around the body. This is the central aspect of disease induced by microorganisms in our gut. Um, many conditions can cause breakdown of the wall of the intestine, um, certainly one of which you deal with on a daily basis, patients who have neutropenia after chemotherapy and go on to have breakdown of the wall and subsequent infections outside the bowel or even in the bloodstream or sites remote from the bowel. But that process is uh, in individuals felt to be healthy, but also in individuals who are suffering oncologic diseases, leads to this state of chronic inflammation. So, when we change the microbiome or the microbiota of the gut, what happens? Let's take a look at some examples of what we've learned from history so far. H. pylori, what uh, is now known to be the cause of gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers. That is a very common resident of the gut and the human microbiome. This uh, is a picture of the Nobel Prize ceremony that Dr. Barry Marshall uh, attended when he received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2005 for his work on H. pylori. I, many of you may know this story, but what he showed was that ulcers were caused by H. pylori. And uh, he did that when, as a medical student, he underwent endoscopy and biopsies while healthy, and they found no evidence of H. pylori in his gut. He then ingested large, uh, a culture of Helicobacter pylori, developed horrible ulcer disease, went back, had another endoscopy with biopsies, and they showed that these organisms were then uh, inhabiting these ulcers in the gut. Uh, and uh, that led to a new era of treatment for gastric ulcer disease. That led to the use of antibiotics for treating duodenal and gastric peptic ulcer disease. Once that started, that treatment, gastric cancer began to plummet. And in the Western Hemisphere and the developed world, gastric cancer rates have gone down significantly since that time. But as the law of unintended consequences uh, exists, something else happened. Uh, in countries where H. pylori treatment was common, you'll see from this graph that rates of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, adenocarcinoma, began to rise, as shown on these graphs. At the same time, squamous cell cancer of the esophagus was declining. But to everyone's surprise, there was a change in countries that were treating H. pylori commonly in the types of esophageal cancer that were present. Uh, this graph shows that in another way. Between the, uh, about 1980 and 2010, you can see, relatively speaking, esophageal cancer rates increased and gastric cancer rates decreased dramatically. Also, in a sense, the rest of the world where helicobacter treatment was not common served as a control because in those countries, gastric cancer rates were essentially unchanged during this time. HIV and the gut. HIV is a part of uh, my career that I've spent the majority of my career focusing on, uh, researching and treating. Uh, 
So let's look at what happens in the gut when HIV first enters the gut. This slide shows uh, colonoscopy images both before and after HIV infection. Uh, the uh, portion on the left shows normal colonic wall, and you can see those yellowish deposits there represent healthy tissue. Within days, within days of HIV infection, the wall of the bowel becomes completely denuded of those deposits. And, uh, and sh as shown down below in the biopsies with the stains there, what's missing are CD4 positive T cells. Those are the cells that are linked to HIV disease progression, and they are essentially uh, knocked out of the bowel within days of HIV entering uh, the body. Um, this uh, then has been shown by Danny Dueck from National Institutes of Health to lead to a state of enhanced inflammation uh, where um, they can detect parts of bacteria floating around the bloodstream at higher levels than in those individuals before they were HIV infected. And in particular, something called lipopolysaccharide, or LPS, which creates, again, a lot of inflammation. When this happens, they find that people who had more depletion of the healthy cells in their gut from HIV go on to have a worse course from their HIV disease. They progress to AIDS faster, and they have, on average, higher HIV viral loads and lower T cell counts even years later. So this is an example of how a new organism entering the body can change what happens uh, through, uh, in the bowel and, there, and around the body as a whole over time. So shifting now to the topic of antibiotics. Um, I prescribe antibiotics every day. I also view antibiotics as, in effect, a neutron bomb for the microbiome and the microbiota in our bodies. Antibiotics kill a lot of things that we like, but they kill a lot of things that we don't like. When they're used, you can see very quickly a change in the microbiome or the microbiota of the gut. Uh, e. coli bacteria grow dramatically for most patients, and Prevotella, which normally are living in high quantities in the bowel, uh, are, are diminished in number significantly. People think of this as collateral damage that the antibiotics uh, create. The, so this is where most antibiotic resistance is created in the, in the gut. When antibiotics are used that change the microbiome in the gut, the proliferation of, proliferation of these organisms known as the escape organisms uh, arise. So the escape term is one I think is useful for all of us to know, and this is what it represents. It's a collection of names of the most common bacteria that exhibit the highest degrees of antibiotic resistance and most of the morbidity and mortality from superbugs that we see today. Uh, and you can see them listing here, things that we all deal with on a regular basis. Um, I will pay, point out in particular um, the bottom four on the slide, Klebsiella, E. coli, then Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter, those are all gram-negative organisms. Those are the ones where we have the most concern about resistance and the fewest antibiotics available to treat drug-resistant strains of this type. So um, this is what happens when the collateral damage from antibiotics ensues. We also know that in countries that use more antibiotics, the microbiome, even for healthy individuals not taking antibiotics, is different. In the Western Hemisphere, there's more bacteroides in the gut. In countries using uh, non-Western Hemisphere that traditionally maybe have used less antibiotics, there's more Prevotella around. So there are differences uh, that exist based on that. C. difficile is really the most um, visible and dramatic consequence that we see in our work on a daily basis when we alter the gut microbiome with antibiotics. Because of the extraordinary importance of C. difficile disease, for those of us in Central California but, and those of us around the world, I'm going to spend some time going over this and its relationship to the microbiome with you. There's a new strain of C. diff that emerged around the turn of the millennium. 
It's called the BI strain or the NAP1 strain, and it is much more aggressive than the traditional C. diff strain. It's resistant to fluoroquinolone drugs, and it has a lot more toxin that it produces. So that's why it causes worse disease for our patients than it used to, and also why it's more transmissible within healthcare settings and from person to person than it was prior to the advent of this new strain. The development and use of fluoroquinolone antibiotics like Leviquin, Avalox, Cipro, Ofloxacin are uh, parallel very closely the worsening C. diff epidemic that we see in the United States. C. diff is now, in fact, the most common healthcare-associated infection in the U.S. I think most of us would have guessed that MRSA was probably the most common, but that's not the case. It's C. diff. That's been the case since about 2008. Here's some uh, local numbers from what we see at Cottage Health. This graph um, shows you, on the top line, the number of patients admitted to Cottage whose C. difficile disease had onset in the community, and the bottom line shows us the number that arose associated with admission to Cottage. And as you can see, over the last few years, there's been uh, almost a tripling of the number of cases that we admit to the hospital with C. difficile. Uh, and uh, the stats now are we're admitting about a patient every day and a half with C. diff. Again, roughly two-thirds of these are coming from outside the walls of the hospital uh, and are contracting their C. diff from exposures elsewhere. So this is a community problem and a regional problem that we are seeing. At the same time, we're using fewer antibiotics at Cottage. Um, this is data from our antibiotic stewardship program looking at broad spectrum antibiotic use. And that has gone down since about 2012 when that program started. So despite fewer antibiotics, in the hospital, we're seeing more C. diff. That's because of unrestrained antibiotic use in the community and increased virulence of this pathogen. One thing it's important for all of us in healthcare to appreciate is not all antibiotics are the same in the collateral damage that they cause to the microbiome and therefore not the same in the risk of creating C. diff because C. diff arises when, as you know, the normal organisms in our gut are wiped out by antibiotics, allowing the invasive C. difficile to move in. Uh, so that's why you'll see many infectious disease doctors love the antibiotic Bactrim and love doxycycline. It does some nice work for us, but at the same time, it doesn't have that same risk of C. difficile. Uh, historically, and back in med school, I was taught and everyone was taught that clindamycin was the worst drug in terms of creating C. diff. That's not really the case based on much better studies that have been done over the last several years. Uh, it's sort of a mid-level offender. The worst drugs in terms of collateral damage in creating C. diff are uh, the quinolones that I mentioned, so Cipro, Leviquin, and then cephalosporins like rocephin uh, and ceftazidime and cefepime, which is used in many of the oncology words. Those drugs are, need to be used extremely carefully because of that risk of C. diff. Oncology patients have a higher risk of C. diff than the general hospitalized population because of their weakened immune system. In particular, when cephalosporins are combined with quinolones, so rocephin cipro, rocephin leviquin, how many of you have seen patients on that? I know we all have. That is in my opinion, almost a contraindicated treatment now because the risk of C. diff from that combination is extraordinarily high, roughly 60 times that of uh, patients receiving other antibiotics or antibiotics individually. So let's talk about fecal transplants. <laughs> so um, fecal transplant is a relatively new treatment for C. difficile disease where donor stool is infused into a patient who suffers from C. diff. This is really the first directed manipulation of the gut microbiome and microbiota for treatment purposes of patients. Whereas antibiotics, historically, everything that happened in the gut was inadvertent and unintended. Fecal transplants were intending to modify that microbiome. And in my opinion, this represents a completely new paradigm for how infections are treated and the beginning of a new era where we're starting to move away from antibiotics and move towards uh, other ways of treating infectious disease. 
Unfortunately, when we first started doing this, it was felt that this should not be used for patients on chemotherapy or patients with malignancies because this is a transplant. We're infusing living organisms that have a higher potential to disseminate or cause trouble around the body. Um, as we and uh, organizations and others have become more and more comfortable and have more experience doing fecal transplants, we are starting to see this used some, and I caution some, in select patients with malignancies or certain chemotherapy regimens. But it still has to be used very cautiously in this population. The, uh, this is a graph from the main clinical trial in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published in 2013 that led to widespread expansion of the use of fecal transplants. And uh, on the left, you can see the success rates at treating C. diff and preventing relapse with fecal transplants, 80 to 90 plus percent, whereas on the right, success two bars, success rates roughly 30 percent when patients are treated with oral vancomycin, which uh, stays in the bowel and does not uh, go beyond the bowel wall. So dramatic difference in success and prevention of relapse in this uh, major study. There have been some studies subsequent to this that were not quite as promising, but by and large, uh, we still feel that this is the best treatment available now for recurring C. difficile disease. Uh, now, um, you don't even have to have a colonoscopy to do this. You, this comes as capsules now. And in certain, uh, you can obtain capsules of donor stool uh, that are ingested and serve as a fecal transplant. Um, this picture depicts the number of capsules that one has to ingest in a short time period in order to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to be, have a successful fecal transplant. So as you can see, this is not for everyone. <laughs> that's one dose. That's what represents one transplant. It's like 30-some capsules in a few hours. So, and we usually recommend more than one fecal transplant. We usually do a series of them if they're being done. But for someone who can't have a colonoscopy or whatever reason, this is a viable alternative. Um, so, uh, briefly touch on other developments in C. diff, which is in C. diff treatment and therapy, which is fantastic um, because we have so many problems with it. Um, and new medications in PLAVA, uh, which I used for the first time in an oncology patient maybe a month or so ago, um, is a monoclonal antibody that uh, binds and blocks one of the toxins that C. diff creates and uh, is uh, a way of uh, decreasing relapse rates. And that's particularly useful in oncology when patients maybe can't have a fecal transplant. Um, it's a single, single infusion. Um, there are vaccines for C. diff that are in late stage trials that look very promising, as well as um, compounds that consist of C. diff that is actually modified to be non-pathogenic. So people can ingest actually C. diff, but a strain of it that is not harmful. Uh, those are promising too. We have a drug, Fidaxomycin, uh, already on the market, which has some advantage over vancomycin for certain patients. And there's a movement now towards exploring compounds that can be given uh, at the time when someone might be exposed to C. diff or the time when someone starts antibiotics to prophylax against it. So I think the way we treat C. diff 10 years from now or five years from now is going to be radically different than what we're doing today. Probiotics. Um, so probiotics are, of course, one uh, issue that comes up a lot and is an issue relevant to the microbiome. Probiotic, you're ingesting a living organism and uh, can that be used to help treat or prevent C. difficile disease? So, uh, this slide summarizes a group of studies that have been compiled and analyzed as a whole to see what effect probiotics had on C. difficile, uh, uh, C. difficile prevention when people were taking antibiotics. Any, all the uh, markers to the left of the vertical line indicate a beneficial effect of the probiotic. All the markers to the right of that line indicate a harmful effect of the probiotic. If the line, the horizontal lines cross the vertical line there, there's, you really can't interpret any statistical significance of the trial or of the finding. So at the very bottom, 
uh, triangle there is sort of the pooled effect that they analyzed in all of these different trials looking at probiotics. And so really the uh, synopsis here is probiotics seem to have a very modest effect at prevention of C. difficile when patients are taking antibiotics. Um, that's different from probiotic use in people who already have C. diff. There has not been shown to be any benefit in that population. So I have stopped prescribing probiotics for my patients who already have C. diff based on the latest evidence that we have. Um, so um, same story though for oncology. Probiotics have to be used carefully because since the oncology patients have weakened immune systems, that living organism that's ingested can end up in parts of the body you don't, where you don't want it, like the bloodstream. Um, uh, lactobacillus, a common probiotic, as well as another one, bifidobacterium, have been shown to cause uh, bloodstream infections in hematology oncology patients, particularly those who have neutropenia. Uh, we actually had a case of endocarditis from lactobacillus in Santa Barbara uh, as a result of probiotic use. So for your patients, you have to be awfully sure that the patient is not on myelosuppressive chemotherapy or neutropenic if they're taking probiotics. Changing now to the idea of cancer uh, onset and the microbiome. What's the connection between them? So, whoops, went backwards there. Um, perhaps the best known and longest uh, un or best understood example of this is cervical cancer. So when women are exposed to certain types of HPV virus, that can result in cervical cancer. That being said, all adults, for the most, essentially all adults, carry HPV as part of our normal flora in, the, uh, in various parts of our body. So it's normal to carry HPV. It's just when women are exposed to particular strains of HPV that that then is associated with the subsequent development of cervical cancer uh, as depicted on this slide here. Um, in particular, strains 16 and 18 and, and some others uh, that lead to that. So that's an example of how the vaginal and cervical microbiome uh, can be altered and therefore uh, lead to the development of cancer subsequently. Uh, fortunately, as you may know now, we have vaccines for these high-risk types of HPV that are extraordinarily effective at preventing cervical cancer. The real challenge is just getting these vaccines widely enough deployed so that uh, these uh, high-risk types of HPV are no longer circulating. There's emerging evidence in many other types of malignancies that changes in microbiome or certain organisms as a part of the microbiome can lead to cancer. I've listed just a few of them here. Uh, in colon cancer, the individuals with colon cancer are much more likely to be carriers of fusobacterium. Uh, and the same is the case for those with esophageal tumors. When patients have esophageal tumors, if you analyze the tumor and you find fusobacterium in that tumor, that patient has a worse prognosis in terms of their outcome of their esophageal cancer. So there's a very close correlation between carrying some of these organisms and the onset and progression of cancer. Um, one study from the um, University of Michigan where I did my infectious disease training in my residency um, looked at uh, what happens in mice if you transplant the microorganisms from the gut of a mouse that had colon cancer to other mice. They found that if you take that or those organisms from the gut and transfer them to a healthy mouse, the recipient mouse is much more, will develop many more tumors than the mouse that received a transplant from a mouse that had no cancer. So in a sense, they're not transplanting the cancer cells but if you transplant the organisms in the gut associated with colon cancer in the mouse, the recipient mouse has a much higher likelihood of uh, having aggressive tumor growth. So really uh, amazing. I think we're just starting to scratch the surface of this field. Um, then let's talk about treatment of cancer. How is it related to the microbiome? How 
do our microorganisms affect our response to cancer therapy? Gemcitabine, a drug which you guys probably know more about than I do because you guys deal with it every day. So gemcitabine for pancreatic cancer um, actually is more prone to fail as a treatment if certain bacteria are present in that tumor or in that patient's gut. In particular, these bacteria called gamma proteobacteria, they metabolize gemcitabine to an inactive drug. So it's been shown that in uh, people who have this organism in their pancreatic duct, that they will have a much higher rate of failure on gemcitabine than those who do not. And unfortunately, though, most patients with pancreatic cancer um, actually carry this gamma proteobacteria as part of their, uh, part of their malignancy in their microbiome. Uh, so there was another study done not long ago where they gave Cipro to mice along with gemcitabine. And the combination of the gemcitabine with the Cipro was much more effective at treating the pancreatic cancer, presumably by its effect on these gamma proteobacteria that it had. So that's one of the, uh, I'm not a big fan of Cipro, but this may be a redeeming factor of that drug. <laughs> um, immunotherapy, so obviously cancer immunotherapy is one of the most exciting frontiers in all of medicine today. It's absolutely spectacular what's happening in this realm. Um, but even immunotherapies effectiveness are subject to the environment that they are uh, operating in, in terms of what is the microbiome present in the individual receiving these immunotherapies. Um, this little cartoon I downloaded from the Dana-Farber blog, and um, there's actually a video associated with it that I um, encourage you, if you have a moment, to just go to the Dana-Farber blog and look at. This is a really well done way of describing how these immunotherapies work and also giving us some inf uh, insights into where microorganisms interact with this process. So what's depicted here is a cancer cell and a human T cell. And normally, the human T cells, right, in particular cytotoxic T8 cells, are those that are harnessed to attack the cancer cells. And they do that by recognizing the cancer cells as invaders or foreign. But the cancer cells are sneaky. What they do is they express this molecule on the surface called PDL1, as shown there, that allows, it sort of makes them like a Trojan horse so that the T cells cannot recognize that the cancer cells are there or foreign. And so the T cells don't attack the cancer cells when the cancer cells express this PDL1. And that happens when, uh, or I should say, normally, um, what the cancer cell does is it binds that PDL1 to a receptor on the T cell called PD1. When, those, when that binding occurs, that's when the cancer cell becomes invisible to the immune system. These Immunotherapies, in particular these antibodies, monoclonal antibodies that are out there, they bind that T cell receptor. That's the little green triangle and it's shown there binding PD1 in this cartoon. When those antibodies bind that T cell receptor, now the T cell recognizes the cancer as foreign and goes after it. Uh, so it's a way of making it no longer invisible to the immune system. So uh, uh, and what they've learned is that these immunotherapies uh, are, and their effectiveness at making the cancer cell visible to the T cell relies upon our gut microbiota. Uh, in particular, much of this work has been done on uh, the drug Yervoy and ipilimumab by one of my friends from med school, in fact, who's one of the lead uh, people who's come up with this, uh, this approach to treatment of cancer. And um, they uh, have shown that certain uh, prevalence of microorganisms has a significant impact on your boy's ability to kill myeloma cells. Uh, 
sorry, melanoma cells. I've got myeloma on the brain, melanoma cells. Uh, this concept uh, of these drugs, like Yervoy, like Keytruda, like Opdivo, are called checkpoint inhibitors, as you know. And that checkpoint represents this portion back here where the, um, uh, two, the T cell and the cancer cell bind at that point. The checkpoint inhibitors are these green molecules that come in there and bind up that T cell receptor and therefore allow the T cell to say, whoa, this cancer cell doesn't belong here, let's get it, okay? <clears throat> Um, and what they showed with ipilimumab is that bifidobacterium, um, in, when given with mice, makes urevoir ipilimumab much more effective. So uh, for reasons I think that are still being elucidated, um, it's another example of how there's potential for modifying our microbiome to make other cancer treatments and immunotherapies more effective. Some of the results in these trials have been absolutely startling, where when uh, bifidobacterium supplements in these mice trials, and even now apparently in a few human cases, has been added to ipilimumab, extremely refra refractory uh, melanomas with wide metastases have either resolved or receded dramatically. Um, I guess now Merck is sponsoring, I understand, a clinical trial with Keytruda and adding bifidobacterium to it to see what effectiveness it may add. So stay tuned. Uh, so really fascinating um, science here, but is really beginning to, for us to appreciate how the microbiome interfaces with treatments that uh, may be available for our patients with cancer. Um, so I'll close now before opening up for questions just by uh, summarizing that you know this whole concept of the microbiome, in my opinion, um, impacts every field of medicine today, uh, in particular those of us uh, in the world of oncology and infectious diseases where the two are so closely related. Uh, alterations either unintentional or intentional in our microbiome, or in particular the gut microbiome, has major health implications uh, for us. It can be beneficial or it can be harmful. One of the most harmful ones, of course, is C. diff, and we talked about how that's uh, such a problem today. Uh, and this whole, again, I want to emphasize, and if you take one message away from here today, this whole concept of the microbiome and chronic disease is based on how changes in the microbiome can increase or decrease levels of inflammation in our body that then trigger other diseases, whether it be rheumatoid arthritis, uh, Crohn's disease, or so on and so forth. Uh, and then remember that these, micro, these organisms in our gut can help us um, fight cancers better, but also, if they're disturbed, can have it lead to an increased risk of certain malignancies. That's it. Thank you. And I'm happy to questions? take questions for anyone. Got one in the back here? Yes, you? I can't see. Oh. Go ahead. In regards to inflammation, if you don't take antibiotics, but you, inflammation is still known to cause problems, what can a person do to help their system be more healthy and not have inflammation? Mm. Well, first of all, we all have inflammation, and inflammation is not necessarily a bad thing. Inflammation is a normal part of our existence because uh, inflammation helps us, for example, kill off infection, right? If we don't have any inflammation around, we can't kill off infections. So it, it's, uh, the answer to that question, I think, is it's a matter of how much inflammation is around and that not all types of inflammation are the same. Um, different chemicals released in the body, interleukins, cytokines, things like that, create different types of inflammation. So it's, um, it's really a matter of regulating, trying to regulate the amount of inflammation, but also the types of inflammatory compounds and chemicals that are floating around our body. So, um, you know, antibiotics will affect inflammation, sometimes favorably, sometimes adversely. Um, Anti-inflammatory drugs, right, drugs that we use. But on a, on a daily basis, 
certainly uh, things that are known to affect inflammation in our body. Cigarette smoking is a huge one. All the usual suspects, stress, exercise, all of these things can affect inflammation uh, in various capacities. So I don't think there's any one answer to it, but I think the things that you generally associate with a healthy lifestyle are those that lead to a more favorable balance and level of inflammation in our, in our bodies. Anything else? Uh, yeah, Kate. showing that in our hemisphere when we more clean, more uh, basically go from the nature and more like sterile environment, uh, there's higher incidence of autism in the kids versus in the countries where there's the children are exposed to more like environmental, pollu like no, nature produce environmental pollutants. So their microbiota within GI is more like um, diverse mm -hmm. and they're more prone to autism. Do you think that mm -hmm. maybe the difference is that we live a little bit too sterile life and our my organism, that kind of gets more inflammation because it's not oh. used to, to those things? Yeah, there's, um, so what you're raising, Katie, is really the, the question of our environment around us and how that affects inflammation, but also how our body handles inflammation and what diseases we're prone to as a result of inflammation. And certainly, I didn't really get into the environment for reasons of time, but with the H. pylori example, for example, uh, you know, some of the reason that there's less H. pylori in the Western Hemisphere is due to sanitation. That's some of it, okay? So, um, so antibiotics don't tell the whole story there, but they're a big part of it. And you make a very, very important point that um, in exposure to um, organisms at different times in our life have different impacts on us. So um, a classic example is asthma. We know now, right, that children that grow up in these ultra-clean, ultra-sterile environments, maybe where they're around less kids, um, they're, you know, antiseptics everywhere, they may be more prone to asthma than kids that live in a, quote, dirty, if you will, uh, environment because it gets to this concept of what's called immune tolerance where um, when we are exposed to certain organisms at early in our life, we're better able to tolerate them and our bodies don't create as much of an inflammatory response as if we get exposed to them later in life. So um, absolutely what happens and what we're exposed to while we're growing up has a huge impact on diseases later in our life and ch patterns of inflammation later in our life, largely through how the microbiome uh, in our gut differs uh, as uh, according to our exposures where we grew up. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question over here. I kind of have two questions. Sorry. <laughs> One is, I've learned from some holistic dietitians that Sugar can increase inflammation, alcohol, obviously. And they recommend fermented foods, um, apple cider vinegar, uh, natural probiotics like BioK. Um, I'm just wondering how you feel about that as far as that helping the microbiome. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other question is, on, in the hospital, most doctors, when they put patients on antibiotics lately, I noticed they order Floristar, Floristar right? Is that the one yes. that they order? Yeah. Um, what, how do you know which probiotic to give or to take when you are having um, issues with your gut or you are on a certain antibiotic? I mean, all our microbiome is so different. Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you raise the question of sugar and its relationship to inflammation. I don't know how many of you saw on CNN today, there's a headline saying, you know, sugar is linked to cancer, you know. Now, high sugar rates are linked to cancer. And, uh, and I think the answer to your question is we're really just beginning to understand this. We're just scratching the surface and our appreciation of how high sugar consumption um, impacts inflammation in our body is, is mostly still to be uh, explored. But we're starting to get important clues um, that uh, high rates of sugar con consumption um, 
uh, may be linked to more inflammation. The um, important thing of that, though, is that that sugar consumption has to be distinguished from obesity because we know when patients are obese, fat cells are extremely strong uh, drivers of inflammation. And individuals that are morbidly obese have, on average, dramatically higher rates of inflammation in their bodies. So any study on sugar in particular has to be distinguished from someone who's overweight. Okay? They can't be linked. Uh, if you're really trying to measure the, the driving factor or driving force that sugar consumption has. So to answer your question about what should we be eating, you know, probiotics, vinegar, things like that, I think it's, it's un, unknown. It's really unknown. You know, there are as many theories and recommendations on what we should do from a dietary standpoint as there are hours, you know, in the year. So it, I really don't have a good answer for it, and I'm not sure anybody does right now. Uh, but in terms of probiotics and their use in individuals um, taking antibiotics, there uh, are some studies that have shown that Florastor, which is Saccharomyces brewer's yeast, is preferred, and there's others that are showing this uh, BioK plus is preferred, and there's still others showing other probiotics. But in general, if you remember the slide I put up that had all those studies in this meta-analysis and showed their, relatively, uh, their relative impact on uh, C. diff, there seems to be a slight preference for BioK plus over Florastor from those trials. But I, it, it's hard to make a super strong recommendation there. I think. So, Question here? The one over here. Um, have very many studies been done on infant guts and the, the, the bacteria that are growing in them in, say, a breastfed versus a formula-fed baby? And if there is a difference, is there any kind of line of treatment looking along the lines of using breast milk as a way of restoring flora in the adult gut? Mm. Um, I can't say I have an expertise on that particular aspect of the uh, microbiota and microbiome. What I can comment, though, is that there is really compelling data about the importance of an infant passing through the birth canal and how that affects that individual's microbiome and microbiota in a very beneficial way. So something we used to not appreciate, that in, uh, children born by cesarean section have a very different gut microbiome than those that pass through the birth canal. So that is now a factor that I think um, you're seeing uh, used at the time of delivery to help make treatment decisions on how, um, you know, that, inf that influence the choice of how a child is born. Um, but I can't really, I really don't have good information. I can't give you a good answer on the breast milk answer, but great question. Okay, I think we have time for one more. I was actually just curious about the relationship between the gut and Alzheimer's disease. Is that infection or inflammation? And if so, is it something that's only associated with the aging or older yeah. population? Yeah, it, I think it's, it's um, the way I would characterize that relationship now is it's a tantalizing relationship, but not proven. Um, you know, what I showed in those couple of slides was that, well, um, we've long known that amyloid is linked on brain pathology to Alzheimer's disease but no one's really been able to show that that was the cause of Alzheimer's disease. And what we're seeing now is that there are, that amyloid may represent a response to an infection. So salmonella creates amyloid plaques, we know that. So um, it's not to say that the primary cause of Alzheimer's is salmonella infection, but there's a very tantalizing relationship there as to here's a microorganism that we know can create these type of lesions uh, in the brain when uh, somebody's exposed to that bug. And, it, and there's other, um, you know, I think researchers are really starting to focus in on this now. And that's been a shift in just the last few years, you know. Um, we're going to see studies like this coming out for all sorts of disease states. I mean, the amount of research going on in the microbiome now is, 
enormous. You know, medical schools are setting up whole microbiome institutes um, just to start to answer questions, just like you ask. But, you know, it's the research on Alzheimer's has long been a frustrating one because they could see these plaques, but no one really understood whether they were cause or just bystander de deposits in the brain. And now they're seeing new directions emerge. And, and clearly there's a relationship between Alzheimer's and inflammation, and it, it is yet to be determined. So. Okay, you had me at fecal transplant. Let's just talk <laughs> about that for a second. So how often is that happening? Because that's really, that kind of blows my mind. Yeah. Because the whole idea of how you donate your stool in the first place is pretty interesting. But, um, <laughs> but how long has that been going on for and how often does it happen? Because yeah. I've heard about it. I've never met anybody that's actually done it. And I can't wait until I do. But, um, is that something that's common in the hospitals more these days? Yes, it is. Uh, fecal transplants have been going on for a few decades uh, in small numbers. And over the last five years, there's been an absolute, I won't use the word, I won't go there, increase <laughs> in, in them. Um, and, uh, and much of that, uh, is because of this data on C. diff. Um, now, though, it's become a commercial product. There's a company that we use at Cottage called Open Biome. And what do they do? They provide processed donor stool for fecal transplants. So these are, uh, because of the C. diff epidemic and the severity of C. diff and the lack of effective treatments, this has become, rel I wouldn't say commonplace, but much more common than it used to be. Um, and it's done, you know, it's done, I've probably um, coordinated that for 15 to 20 patients of my own over the last few years. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's happening. Uh, and now that it's even available in different formulations, it's happening even more. What we are seeing is now people are starting to do this for diseases other than C. diff. And whether the evidence supports that or not is another question, but we're hearing about this being used sort of off-label for other disease states uh, to try to regulate inflammation and in the bowel. So stay tuned. All right. Thank you.